Uh, we'll get started with a special event this morning. We're going to have uh, Mr. Greg Burks, who is the coordinator of officials for the Big 12. And so, Greg, we're going to let you get started and kick it off this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending. Um, this will be a rather short presentation this year uh, on the rule changes. I will go through the changes quickly, and then I've got a couple of plays to share with you, and I'll answer any questions at that time. Um, as I mentioned before, the rules uh, for the NCAA football is on a two-year cycle. This is an off year, and so in an off year, the only rules that can be addressed are those that uh, relate to player safety. So we see a couple of things in the rules this year, and uh, they deal with player safety. A change in targeting this year, uh, all targeting will be reviewed and uh, all elements of the targeting must be confirmed for a player to be disqualified. It's a little bit of a distinction in that in the past, a call on the field would stand if there wasn't anything to demonstrate that all elements were present. So in the replay booth this year, all elements of targeting must present themselves or the call will be overturned. Uh, it's a small distinction, but I think it uh, instead of going to the assumption that the call on the field was correct because of the penalty being as severe as it is with the disqualification, this year every one of those plays will be completely reviewed and if one of the elements of targeting is not there, the call will be overturned. Targeting elements basically fall, targeting falls into two groups, 913 and 914. 913 is using the crown of the helmet. And by crown, we define if you take the top of the face mask and make a circle around the helmet, that's the crown. It is illegal for any player to use that part of his equipment to deliver a blow. It is intended for that player not to use that part of the helmet because it puts them at risk when they drop their head. Second part, second element is a uh, 914, which is a defenseless player. By definition, a defenseless player is a quarterback, a kicker, a receiver who hasn't had time to put the ball away. If you hit any of those players above the shoulders with any part of your body, that's a 914 foul and is the second part of the targeting foul. Indicators of targeting, I, I think if you've, and I know you all have paid attention, you'll hear these things mentioned, a launch, a crouch, a thrust, leading with the helmet, the forearm, lowering the head. The biggest change in the rule book this year that demonstrates targeting is the word attacking, and you'll see in the fourth piece there, we are looking for those plays when a player is attacking another player. We've had some targeting fouls in the past where a player really is not initiating the contact, but there's been helmet to helmet. Without that attacking piece, targeting will not stand this year. If a student athlete receives a third targeting foul during the course of a season, they will be out for the remainder of that game and they will also receive an automatic one game suspension. There's not very many players that this applies to. I don't know nationally what that is, but it's under five. The point here is, is that we wanna make sure that players are being taught not to uh, engage in targeting action. And if we do have repeat offenders to that degree, they will be penalized in an additional game. Uh, last year, uh, LSU uh, was involved in a game where they had seven overtimes. The number of plays in a seven overtime game is deemed to be unsafe, too many plays. And so under overtime scoring, the first four overtimes this year will be played exactly the same way. Beginning with the fifth extra period, we will no longer have uh, the traditional overtime will just immediately go to a two-point try. Remember after the third, you can't kick a field goal, you have to go for two, so it'll be a two-point try at that spot. And uh, in absence of media timeouts, after the second and fourth extra period, there'll be a two-minute mandatory break. Uh, these changes were made to protect student athletes that uh, too many plays are being involved when we go to overtime games and trying to make sure uh, their safety is uh, taken care of in that game. This is uh, the 
in talking to coaches so far, the two things that they've been most concerned with is the illegal wedge formation and the blindside block, which I'll cover in a minute. We've always had a rule for three-man wedge being illegal. That came in a few years ago. The exact same verbiage for that rule is now in place for a two-man wedge. The statistics tell us that kickoffs now are just about as safe as any other scrimmage play, which is a positive move. But the injuries that are occurring generally deal with players that are trying to break up that two-man wedge. And so what we're saying is, is a wedge is defined as two players aligned shoulder to shoulder within two yards of each other. Two yards is six feet. Um, that's a little bit of a distance. But I think when I show you the film, you'll see that we're trying to prevent players coming together on kickoffs and aligning together shoulder to shoulder, starting up the field, and then creating a block where that kickoff cover player has to try and blow that wedge up. And so we're going to try and eliminate that this year. Uh, as I mentioned, the verbiage is exactly the same as it was for a three-man wedge. It's a live ball foul. Uh, the formation of the wedge is not illegal when the kick is from an onside kick formation. And there is no foul, and this is important, uh, when, it when the kick results in a touchback, a free kick out of bounds, or a fair catch. So whether there's contact or not on this play, it's the alignment of those, those two players when they get together on the kick that creates the foul. And uh, I've got a couple of those plays that we'll look at here when I'm finished. Blindside block. Again, this is a safety-related issue. Uh, by definition, a blindside block is an open field block and against an opponent that is initiated outside the vision. Where we see these plays often are on turnovers, are on kicks, where defenders are pursuing the ball carrier or the receiver, and outside of their vision, another player comes and, and decletes them. And this play, while legal last year, uh, this rule change occurred in high school football a few years ago, and on those blocks, all blockers have to lead with their hands and push. So the difference in the college rule is, is if you look at that second point, no player shall deliver a blindside block by attacking, the word attacking again, an opponent with forcible contact. So you can still have a blindside block, but you can't deliver it with forcible contact. By definition, forcible contact is pretty hard to clearly define, but the way we look at it in officiating is if you use your shoulder or your torso, and you attack or deliver that blow with force, that will be an illegal blindside block. The block could still be made if you push, brush, spray paint is a new term I heard this year. Uh, the rule, when it went through the rules committee, the coaches asked that we not define uh, exactly what that block is or what they have to do to make the block and leave it to them to figure out how to make the block. It's pretty easy to keep a player from getting to the ball carrier when they're running at those speeds. A simple shove will move them by there, a push, but we want to eliminate that D cleater where we really see somebody leveled and they don't see the uh, play coming at all. In addition, if this action has all the elements of targeting, meaning it's above the shoulders, then it would be a targeting foul as well as a blindside block. Blocking below the waist, this is just an addendum to the rule and the ruling uh, that was in the book last year pretty much addressed everything just from the offensive perspective. We've just added to the defensive responsibilities the same rules that were the offensive. And basically that means the defensive team cannot block below the waist when it's not from the front. We define from the front 10 to 2. Uh, that creates issues for people, but basically if you put your hand on the steering wheel at 10 to 2, that block needs to be directed from that direction so the player being blocked is able to defend themselves. Starting next year, all assignments for officiating crews, meaning when two conferences play each other, replay officials will be assigned with the field officials. Small distinction, uh, contracts were written in the past where many times the visiting team may have the on-field officials be from their conference and the home team uh, had replay starting next year and in most cases this year both the on-field and the replay will be assigned together. The rationale there is those two teams, the replay and the on-field, really are one team and it's much more effective when they work together. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time coaches phones and headsets. Uh, one, that's not really the purview of the on-field officials. 
This is an administrative issue, uh, but it's been uh, cleared up a little bit. 23 communication devices allowed, 15 for countable coaches, and this is managed by the game administrator. Okay, I'll show you a couple of plays here uh, that deal with uh, the wedge and then also blindside blocks. So if we look at this play, again, it's a free kick. And if we look at the deep receivers here, you'll see the players come together. They are within the designated six feet and they move up the field together. The foul would occur at this point. Primary on this call is the referee. You'll see him in the end zone and the two line of scrimmage officials will be looking at that play as well. This will take a little bit of an adjustment because a lot of teams have run this two man wedge. Uh, so in getting with the coaching staffs around the conference, my hope is, is that we're able to uh, prevent this from happening and that we don't see a call too many times. Uh, it, the, the officiating crews do have to look at, and you'll see on this play, the wedge actually doesn't go after the same player. And I do need to make the distinction that it, a double team block is not illegal. A two-man wedge is illegal. So you are going to have plays where players are coming from separate angles that end up blocking the same player. That's legal. They just can't come together and then move up the field and block that player. There's a view from the back angle that the referee would have most of the time. If they grab hands, it makes it a little easier for us to know they're within six yards. By the way, that is our usual film that we get when we uh, look at film, when we grade film. We have uh, sideline, end zone, TV, and wide angle. And so as we evaluate our, our referees, our officials, those are the angles that we generally get. Uh, going into our clinic this year, we have 8,000 graded plays from last year that we will be reviewing. Each of those are divided by foul code. We will be breaking by position and looking at each of those plays, what we did right, what we did wrong. And uh, we'll be looking at these plays specifically as they apply to the new rules. This is another example. As you can see, the two up men come together. Right there, as soon as they move forward, again, they grabbed hands. This would be an illegal two-man wedge because the ball was returned. It's an unsportsmanlike foul. And this is important. It's an unsportsmanlike foul. It does not count towards the two unsportsmanlike foul for, di for disqualification. So you, you may hear unsportsmanlike, but this is a foul that does not count towards disqualification. As soon as they move forward and the kick is in play, the foul occurs. In that case, they do block together one player. This play deals with uh, blindside blocks. And what you're going to see is a punt, and then you're going to see the punt returners peel back, and there will be two blocks in this play that uh, are both outside the vision of the players being blocked. And this was both these blocks last year were legal if they're from the front, and illegal this year because they're blindside. You'll see the two players coming in blue right there, and they both block. This year, that's illegal because they're outside the view of those players. And the top block of those two, because of the proximity of that, would be looked at for a targeting play. And in fact, would be targeting. The goal is to eliminate those kind of hits. And both of these, both of these blocks, you'll note that these blocks could be made without force. They could simply push those players. There's been a little pushback from some folks who say, that's not football. The reality is we want to make sure that these kids are going to be able to play next week. And we're trying to eliminate any of those plays that might prevent that.
that's my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. That's fine. There's three there, so. Hey, hey Greg. Brian Davis, Austin American Statesman. Um, I hate asking about this topic, but but we need some clarity on this. What is your stance on the horns down? I mean, is that a penalty? Is that an unsportsmanlike penalty? Should it not be a penalty? Do you tell your refs, hey, either call it or don't call it? Somehow I knew I was going to get that question today. Um, the reality or the right, the answer that I'll give you is it depends. It's like any unsportsmanlike act. If somebody scores real quickly turns to their cheering section, it's real quick and moves on, we're probably not going to react to that. If they happen to turn to the other crowd or the other bench or it's prolonged to a player, it would be like any unsportsmanlike act. So I would have to tell you, like any play, there's a degree, who it's directed at. If they do it in their bench area, we're not going to look at it. It'd be like any other celebration foul. So it has to be like almost every other foul we have. Does it rise to a level that we need to deal with that? It's a hot topic. Um, I know people want us to be very definitive on that, but it's like almost any touchdown celebration. Uh, is it directed at an opponent or is it just celebration with your teammates? I think you said, what if they directed at fans? Right, right. Like, yeah. like the Will Greer play last year where he runs in and you know does it yeah. to the to the Texas student body there. I mean is that 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 would be uh, that probably would be a foul in that situation. When we've discussed it, by rule anything that's prolonged to bring attention to the individual rather than the team is a foul. My uh, my advice is if you want to do that, do it back in your bench area. Do it back with teammates. Get get away from where you're an individual drawing attention to yourself. Kevin Kinder with the Blue and Gold News. A little bit of clarification on the blindside block and the view of the player being blocked. Is that also a 10 to 2 situation as you described with the other or a different standard? It's a little bit wider than 10 to 2. Um, there's there's an SEC play of a year ago where there's an interception, and uh, we looked at it as supervisors. The quarterback throws an interception and is just coming back up the field. And while he's now a player, by definition, he's still a defensive player because he's not involved. And it's fascinating because at the last minute, he kind of turns his head and his eyes get big because he sees he's going to get hit. And our discussion was, does he see this coming? Well, just for a fraction of a second and not enough time to defend himself so this would still be a foul when it comes to matters of safety we're always going to err on the side of safety and so the rule is written in a blindside block situation where we just want player behavior to change to where you can shove that player push them not use your torso or drop a shoulder and get the same intended effect to spring that ball carrier without delivering a blow that might hurt somebody Hope that helps. Great. Greg, Drew Davis with the Florida Star Telegram. We saw the NFL allow review of pass interference. Do you think college football will go down that route? And what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I think in the long run, uh, we'll have to see how it works for the NFL. Uh, the Canadian Football League has used instant replay for pass interference for a few years now. And in talking to those folks, it's not been as successful. And here's, here's the reason. Each the line to gain, those are pretty easy things in the sense that it's yes or no. When you watch pass interference, it's not yes or no. It's varying degrees. And uh, it is my opinion that we leave that in the hands of the officials. The NFL, I'm sure, will, uh, I'm glad they're going first on this, and we'll see how that works for them and what conclusions they reach. But uh, I'm, I'm happy with the college rule where it is right now. Hey, Parker Fleming, SB Nation, Frogs of War. Can you clarify a little bit about the wedge and when the flag will be thrown? Will, it, will the flag be thrown when two players are within two yards or will it be when they move up or does it require a hit being 
called, and where will the spot foul be marked off from in the event of a wedge that forms a hit? Yeah, the, the calling official will have to wait to see what happens to the kick. So they'll be instructed to recognize the wedge, where it's at, and the foul occurs when they get together. Uh, I was a prop proponent of they had to move upfield together. That's not how the rule is written. It's when they come together. And that's because that's how the three-man wedge was, and they simply took the wording for the three to the two. So the official will recognize that the foul has occurred, make sure that the kick is in play, throw the flag at that time, and the foul will be from the spot of the foul. Uh, Kurt Bowles from the Austin American. Uh, Greg, as far as the overtime rule, if you really want to just make it safer, why not go to mandatory two-point tries after the first overtime? I think that's been discussed. Uh, the rules committee, when they meet, they discussed all the options. I think college football really likes where college football is right now. Because of a seven-time overtime, which is an aberration, I don't know. I, I don't know that I can remember another seven time. Usually it's over within the three overtimes. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that we want to make huge changes in the rule. I think the overtime that we have is effective and determines the winner in most cases fairly quickly. Uh, I think this will be implemented. We'll see how many times it comes about and then that will be reviewed and if, if there needs to be a change we could do it at that point. Hi, Andrew Miner with 24-7 Sports. When you say all the targeting plays are going to be reviewed now, uh, what, what effect do you see that having on pace of play and how are you going to make sure that we keep the game smooth along? Yeah, we, uh, I, pro I probably said that incorrectly. All targeting fouls have been reviewed already. So every time there's a targeting play, not only is it reviewed on the field, it's reviewed in the Rock Replay Operations Center. So we've already done that. What I should have said, if I didn't say it this way, was all aspects of the replay must show. So all of those indicators that I talked about, 913, 914, attacking posture, something that demonstrates that all of those things are in place, it just clarifies to us that instead of about 15% of all the targeting plays last year were stands. And so the distinction here is instead of when the decision was 50-50, it went with stands because that's what they called on the field. But it's one of the few plays where we tell the officials, if you think it's a foul, throw on this so that we make sure and look at this because of player safety. All other fouls, you need to know it's a foul before you throw it. Any other questions? Thank you for your time.